Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week, Central Texas Gardener explores keyhole gardening with Dr. Deb Tolman. She explains how to build these sustainable, drought-tough vessels, even in small spaces. On tour, visit Gabriel Valley Farms, where nursery plants go organic from seed to store. Daphne explains those mysterious balls on your oak trees. And Trisha shows how to dry herbs to use all year. So let's get growing, right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. Who grows the plants we buy at the nursery? Well, if they were raised locally, you've got a head start to success. Right now, let's take a tour of Gabriel Valley Farms, where organic is the word from seed to store. A Gabriel Valley Farms tag on a plant means that it's been tested to prove true for Central Texas, and it's been organically grown, starting from seed. In 1989, Kathy and Sam Slaughter combined their horticultural backgrounds to start Gabriel Valley Farms on an old cotton field near Georgetown. I decided there was a real need, and there was at the time. You couldn't get locally grown perennials, and certainly not herbs, in, in uh, this part of the country. And so we both thought we had a good idea on that. That's what got us started. In 2008, they received organic certification from the Texas Department of Agriculture. We were always quasi-organic from the get-go. We always tried to be as organic as possible since we were mainly dealing with edibles. That kind of ties your hand on chemicals that you can apply for insect control anyway. So we always tried to be as organic as possible. Their customers include independent nurseries, landscapers, a grocery store, schools, and private nonprofits. We're getting more and more into dealing with farmers on the vegetable side of things and herbs. They're starting to uh, buy a little bit larger plug material, liner material, going straight into the field. Since we, and that, that's come about due to our organic uh, status. Organic people have a real, real problem finding starts and, and plants. We're about the only ones around the area that, that, have, that offer that. The rules state that you must try to source things out as organically as possible. For seeds, you must try three different seed companies to purchase certified organic seed. And if you cannot locate them there, then you are free to buy them non-organically. They just can't be treated seed or GMO seed. For instance, a lot of peppers are treated with a fungicide, captan, and that would not fall under the organic practices. Organically grown plants also don't suffer from chemical withdrawal when you take them home. Since gardeners are broadening their edible horizons, the slaughters add new plants and varieties every year. In the beginning, people were content with having basil, dill, oregano, rosemary. Now they want multiple varieties of basil, dill, oregano. So a lot more varieties of the common herbs and the not so common herbs. Every year we try to do a few new things just to see, you know, if we have requests or whatever, we'll try growing some of that. And uh, just to see if it works here or not. A lot of it's failed miserably, it just doesn't work. And so we'll let that go and then pick up something new and we listen to our customers and what they're looking for. Demand for vegetables is on the rise too. That's probably the biggest, biggest changes in the vegetables. You know, we used to grow just tomatoes, peppers, lettuce in the fall, and then that was about it. And that was always kind of tied in with the bedding plant sales at the nursery. And now, last year after coming through one of the worst droughts, we probably had our best year for growing vegetables. People have made it a priority that if they have to let certain things in their landscape go for watering, they will put a priority and an emphasis on maintaining a vegetable garden to feed their family. And they want to grow year round. People used to have impatience in the front flower bed for decoration or whatever. And now it's cool, it's okay. You can have lettuce out there. We're getting a lot of feedback 
please try to grow some, uh, you know, some of the uh, varieties that are, that are colorful, that would look nice in the front of the house as well. To get plants to market on time, they have to think ahead. Sometimes that means fooling their seeds, like cool weather crops. Nurseries and gardeners alike uh, goes more by the calendar than by what's really going on outside with the weather. So September 1st signals fall, <laughs> and March 1st signals spring. It could be snowing in March, or it could be burning up hot in September. So what we decided was, okay, how in the world are we going to have lettuce and cilantro ready that time of the year? Well, it's still a little bit early to have it ready, but we can get started on it. And so we germinate the seed for cilantro and for uh, dill and for the cool other things, lettuce, in our, in our uh, walk-in cooler. So I set it down at 65, 70 degrees, be 100 degrees outside fools the seed into thinking it's time to get going and they pre-germinate if you will we watch and see when the every day or twice a day we want to see if the soil's disturbed a little bit with a little seedling coming up and then we slam the poor thing into our propagation house but by then he's already committed so um, cruel world out there but uh, it works in winter, they germinate tomato and pepper seeds with bottom heat to bring soil temperature to 75 degrees. Daylight hours also factor in. When you try to trick them too far, they they just don't they don't react. They say, "Well, the day the, the it's too dark, if you will. The, the days are too long. The nights are too long. The days are too short, and so they uh, just won't grow. They'll just sit there because they know that it's not time yet. Um, if we were on the, in the tropics, they, it's about the same all the time, but it's longer days, so they can grow then. And the farther north you go in the winter time, the shorter the days are, and no matter what the heat, fertilizer, temperature, water, all those things, doesn't matter. Uh, they're just not gonna grow. Most plants start in plug trays in a propagation house. They sow progressively to guarantee newcomers at the market every week. Some plants get a spot all to themselves. Others share quarters. Plugs then get potted up into four inch containers. They finish growing up in one of the greenhouses. Kathy and Sam grow some ornamental perennials too. And lavender, the best ones for Central Texas. Their advice for home gardeners? Well, you have to be able to roll with the punches because they'll come. And uh, we often joke that we don't need to go to Las Vegas and gamble. <laughs> we have plenty enough risk right here. And it's um, all in management, how we manage the risk. We're just having a blast. This is, <laughs> this is a lot of fun, and I mean that. For 23 years, we just get up and do this, and there's never a, never a dull moment, and it's never, never complacent. It's always challenging and, and fun. Gardeners by, by nature are, are eternal optimists anyway. Absolutely. I mean, why, why would you plant a seed and bear dirt and think that something is going to emerge from there in, in within a week or two? I mean, it's, it's, it's a miracle, you know, when that happens. And I think gardeners are always uh, optimistic that, uh, that they will be successful. And they realize they'll have some risk and some loss, but they're confident that they will have some success too. Our thanks to the folks at Gabriel Valley Farms, and now we're going to turn our attention to backyard farming with a really special technique called keyhole gardening. I'm joined by Dr. Debbie Tolman, who is an expert in this, and thank you so much for coming on to Central Texas Gardener. Thanks for having me. This is a really exciting concept, uh, keyhole gardening. Tell us a little bit about the roots of this uh, tradition. Well, the roots are in, the roots of keyhole gardens are, they, I think, what, 10 years maybe, mm -hmm. missionaries have been taking keyhole garden, keyhole gardening concepts mm -hmm. to Africa mm -hmm. um, to reteach folks how to intensively garden. But what, what I bring to the table, which is a little different, mm -hmm. is the filling. There's no native soil in the keyhole gardens that I do, mm -hmm. and it's cardboard right. and manure. So uh, the concept is raised gardens. It is. 
kind of shaped like a donut, right, in a sense? No, kind of. It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> it's round. It is simply mm -hmm. just what you said. It right. is a round container garden mm -hmm. with an access to a central basket, which is that kitchen central basket. Right. You know, we have a little model right here. This one, is, you, you've simulated a rock wall surrounding. That's the... right, but you can use anything that you have. Right. That's the right. bonus. Six feet in diameter. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of science underlying these mm -hmm. things, but simply put, there's no native soil. It's six feet in diameter. Mm -hmm. And when you finally finish it, you will actually cone it like a volcano. And so there's some hydrologic reasons for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the center basket is where it gets its name of self-fertilizing, self-watering. Okay. Um, the and concept is very much, there's a lot of moisture in there. Mm -hmm. And basically the center of old basket is where you put your organic waste. And so you, you put your compost right into the heart of the garden. Put your kitchen scraps. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and it just kind of leaches out, in, and the nutrients leach out into the surrounding soil. That's right. Um, but the whole thing is a hot composting setup. Right. And so what you're doing when you finish this thing, mm -hmm. when you finish building it, and it only takes a day, you're planting it immediately. So you're really, so the different concept is you're planting on a hot composting pile. Mm -hmm. That's unusual. It is unusual. Yeah, and you're packing it with plants. So you reserve the top six inches. Um, do mm. we want to get into this much detail? Sure. 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 Really? Yeah. <laughs> you're reserving the top six inches for those little plants that you're going to put in, mm -hmm. and that will help contain mm -hmm. the moisture. So you spend a lot of water in building this thing mm -hmm. from the beginning, right. and then to seal it in in all that cardboard, what you want to do is put this canopy of plants on top of right. it, mulch it, and basically watch it. Right. Um, and you use the cardboard really just to hold everything in place. You know? You're actually using the cardboard to encourage the critters to mm -hmm. come because ah. we want them to start, the biology to start cooking this puppy. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So there's a lot of biology in it. Usually when I mm. give these, I, I really, I try to back off of the science because you'll see the you'll see the visors start to pull down. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're obviously enthusiastic about it, and I can see why. Now, you know, thinking about the tough conditions we have here in Central Texas, this is really ideal for many people who have no soil. Number one, but it's also smart for drought kind of situations. Mm -hmm. so, you know, a lot of people think, "Gosh, raised beds wouldn't that take a lot of moisture?" That's right. It does take a lot of moisture to begin with, but mm -hmm. once that cardboard gets saturated and the manure gets saturated, or manure substitutes get saturated, mm -hmm. then the whole thing takes on a um, moisture holding and air retention. Sounds like a digestive mm -hmm. problem, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the that's the scenario, which is great for plants. Mm -hmm. Moisture will always leach sure. down first, so you've got good drainage, mm -hmm. but you've got that air in there. And I'm, I'm I, I am always and always have been dubious about every little gimmick. And so sure. I treated the keyhole gardens originally when I started mm -hmm. reading about them as gimmicks. Mm -hmm. But they really passed the test on just about everything I've questioned on. Well, them. Uh, let's talk about what you grow in in your keyhole gardens, because you, you, it's for you, it's a very wide range. You even grow fruit trees in your keyhole. I garden. do. The yeah. last one I did has seven fruit trees. Oh, so, mm. so when you pack these things at the mm. end, we're talking seventy tomato plants in one keyhole garden. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. And yeah, I did two yeah. of them, that was 140. That's a lot. But that's the type of sealing that moisture that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, seven fruit trees. So you got very popular tomato harvest time. <laughs> that's, that's right, and I'm done. I was done a long time ago. Right. That's my shtick, mm -hmm. is forget about the summer gardening. Oh, yeah, that's right. probably not appropriate to say. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, a mm -hmm. lot of them, that's the package. Mm -hmm. And so now, and because I don't have any soil, I use those keyhole gardens for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I probably have way too many of them at this point because I can't eat fast enough right. to stuff my scraps in each and every one sure. of the 11 that I have. <laughs> <laughs> a, a little bit obsessive on the keyhole, a little bit. but that's okay. But the trees, so I have one Again. that's devoted to berries. Mm -hmm. So I've got blueberries, blackberries, awesome. strawberries, mm -hmm. Um, goji berry, mm -hmm. and then another one that's devoted to trees, so plum trees, apricots, pomegranates, uh -huh. and you can really do a nice espalier. You will like this. Oh, espalier. Yeah. You get them to come out like this, mm -hmm. but then train them to have a really nice canopy. Mm -hmm. So then you could grow raspberries, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it sounds like a lot of fun, actually. And, and I did. There, you know, 
it, there's a real advantage ergonomically as well to having a raised garden. Mm -hmm. For a lot of people getting on the ears, especially having a, a, a garden that you can literally walk into. Yes. You know? And you can reach. I mean, mm -hmm. So that's the other scientific thing. It's six feet in diameter. You don't mm -hmm. want it any further than three feet from the edge of that center basket. Okay. But that's a reaching thing. That's, that's a comfortable, right. Absolutely. comfortable. Yeah. Now, you haven't asked me about harvesting those 20, 70 tomatoes. <laughs> that was a pain in the butt. But I can imagine. I can imagine. But they were really pretty because I put taller varieties in the back and they cascaded yeah. down. It was mm -hmm. just nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like so, these yeah, things. So, you know, you can reach in. It's at a level that's comfortable to work at. Yeah. And, you know, and it's just a matter of kind of replenishing the organic matter, right? It, it is. And, and you have to be pretty vigilant about that, I would guess. I don't have enough organic matter for these things. So I have to come back and replenish layering, the la same layering process that you, you built on the inside. So mm -hmm. I come back with balled up newspaper, manure, more balled up newspaper, then put a mulch on top of that. And what you're doing mm -hmm. is ultimately you're creating more airspace, which is where right. it gets very compacted at the top. Right, right. Um, so you're really creating more airspace. And if there was one thing that I think makes these things be survivors, it's that airspace. Mm -hmm. Now it does hold a lot of moisture, right. but it's in that cardboard, but the cardboard gets disintegrated really quickly. Mm -hmm. I do have a good story. Okay. Is this yeah, a good time sure, for it? Real, sure. The very first one of these that I did as a workshop was at Ace Garden Center in, in mm -hmm. Clifton. And I wanted kids to have fun and mm -hmm. we all had fun. We did it out of uh, cob and rock. And four weeks to the date after we finished that thing, we had that 10 inch, t -t 10 inch rain. Right. It all dumped mm -hmm. in that keyhole garden. Here's what was missing, a whole wall busted out. So mm -hmm. I got to see firsthand, four weeks after we finished that thing, there was not one piece of cardboard of a half of a dumpster load of cardboard, mm -hmm. not one of 180 phone books, Waco style, mm -hmm. not one of the newspaper, and we had 18 stacks that were two feet wow. high. No, it was incredible. I got to see it, so it was a great learning experience for so me. So just gone. Gone, and yeah. we can't. Uh, you can't make compost. That's a that's four a weeks. burden pile. That's, pretty good. <laughs> that's hot. Right, right. But you're, I mean, by the time the roots get down, mm -hmm. it's cooled down. Those are just spikes. Okay. Real briefly, you, you say it only takes a day to make one of these things. You, right. you teach about this. How can people access, access information about getting started with a keyhole garden? Well, they can go to my website. Okay. Um, there is the DVD, mm -hmm. and they can email me. Okay. <laughs> you said that very quiet. Email. <laughs> email me. <laughs> okay. All right. But I'm sure people will avail themselves of this. It, it's a very exciting way to intensely garden in a very small space. And it's a really ancient technology that you're helping to bring back to life here in Central Texas. So thank you so much for coming on I, board. Thank you. I thought I was going to get very serious yeah. and sciencey on you, so I brought this to remind me to be very lighthearted. Okay. Um, but um, I didn't have to be. You kept me very lighthearted. Okay, thank well, you, Tom. Well, thank you. And now it's time for our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards. Our question this week's a good one. Many viewers have been contacting us about little round red balls on the leaves of their live oak trees. These are galls, and although they may look really weird and kind of scary at first, they're actually very common and there's no need to worry. Thanks to Marianne and Danielle for sending us pictures from their trees. This year we've seen a few more oak leaf galls than in the past few years, thanks to the mild winter and the late spring rains. The galls are actually produced by the tree itself in response to a pest, usually an insect or a mite. Depending on the offending pest, the galls may be many different shapes, sizes, and colors. They might even be fuzzy. The small reddish galls that we're seeing on the undersides of our oak leaves right now are caused by tiny wasps. The wasps lay their eggs on the leaves and the tree responds by forming a protective structure, the gall, to contain the wasp eggs while the insect larvae grow into adults. What a great deal for that wasp. The good news is this process causes no noticeable damage to the tree. As I said, we have them every year. You just usually don't notice them. So there's no reason to treat the tree or try to remove the galls. Your live oak will drop those leaves in a few months and put on new ones. And next year, we most likely won't see as much of an infestation as we did this year. Our plant of the week is skeleton leaf goldeneye, Vigiera stenoloba. This delicate little sunflower relative makes a great addition to any garden bed. 
It makes an attractive, deep green mound that's covered in flowers from summer all the way till frost. It's listed to get up to three feet tall, but normally it stays more in the foot to foot and a half range. It does spread though, usually to about two to three feet. Skeleton leaf goldeneye is native to very rocky areas, so it needs very well-drained soil to grow well. It loves the heat and will do great in full sun, but can also take light shade. Cold winters, this plant will die back to the ground, but it will re-emerge from the roots. In mild winters, it'll be evergreen, but it would still benefit from some shearing back to encourage new, bushier growth. Otherwise, it will get leggy and unattractive if you don't shear it back. Cut them back to about six inches in late winter. The gorgeous, finely textured foliage is aromatic, containing volatile oils, and so that gives the plant some resistance to heavy browsing by deer. To do in your garden this week, it's not too late to plant transplants of beans and summer squash. If our winter is as mild this year as last year, there's still plenty of time for a harvest. And with our nighttime temperatures beginning to cool down a bit, vegetables will start to take off again. You should also be on the lookout for fall webworms. If you catch them early, you'll be able to easily control them with a spray of Bacillus thuringiensis. And after they've developed a thicker, protective web, these insects are very difficult to control and should be pruned out of your trees. I'm sure you know that the Texas AgriLife Extension Service offers many great educational programs, and we've got a good one coming up in October that I'd like to let you know about. It's a three-day series of seminars for anyone who's interested in urban farming. For more information, visit our website, travis-tx.tamu.edu. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org slash ctg to send us your questions or plants from your garden. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. Herbs add so much flavor to our food and wonderful aroma to our house, and they can also be a very decorative item, too. Now, at the end of the season, sometimes it's nice to dry some of the things that we don't have over winter, but really most of the herbs that we grow in this area are perennial, so we don't have to dry everything. But I do like sometimes to dry herbs to share with friends. I have uh, friends who are great cooks, but just don't happen to have a bay tree in their yard. So a nice bundle of bay laurel leaves with a beautiful bow that matches my friend's decor is always gonna be a very welcome gift. And um, you can tie mixed bundles of herbs. This one has Mexican marigold mint, which dies back in the winter, so I don't have it. So I always like to make sure I have that dried. And I've got rosemary and sage and thyme and a little bit of marigold at the top that will dry beautifully and uh, be colorful in the kitchen. And as these dry, then you'll just pick off some of the lower leaves and uh, use the bundles up in your cooking. Now this is a double swag. I basically made two swags, join them in the middle, and I've got some gomfrina that um, is just a wonderful decorative accent. And this one has rosemary and sage and uh, bay laurel. So uh, that's a little bit more difficult to do, but really it's very simple. You're just taking the herbs and bundling, tying with rubber bands. And it's important to use rubber bands because if you use twine or twist ties, the herbs will dry as and shrink as they dry and they'll fall out on the floor. So the rubber bands will contract with the herbs as they shrink. So that's a great uh, way to do that. And then to hide the rubber bands, I just use ribbon, tie a knot in the ribbon, and then I'll put that hanging loop behind and twist the ribbon around a couple of times to hide the rubber band and then tie it in a knot or a bow, whatever you prefer. And uh, that makes a really wonderful adornment for a bottle of wine or a cookbook that you're giving as a gift or just tie it on a gift package. And they're wonderful hanging in the home. Now you wanna hang them in a place that's got good air circulation and not in a lot of sunlight. Uh, heat and sunlight will tend to fade the essential oils and the colors. So you wanna put them in a place that's well ventilated and uh, not too uh, light. And um, some herbs you'll, uh, you could also put on a piece of bamboo or a stake from your, a stick from your garden. So this is a nice little decorative display and I've put some labels so that it helps a beginning cook who might not know what those are. So that's a fun project for you. 
Some herbs, though, don't really dry that well uh, in this manner. Something like lemon verbena will tend to curl. It's not terribly attractive, and it's very delicate. It bruises easily, so you very gently can pull the leaves off and dry them on a window screen or a tray or a basket like this, and just very gently stir them. They'll dry within a couple of uh, days to a week or so. You want to wait till they're nice and crispy, and then put them in a container and uh, that's tightly sealed, and those are wonderful to have for tea. Mint is the same way. I tend to uh, dry my mints this way. Another way to do it is to use a dehydrator. So you can put the more delicate things like mint and, and the lemon verbena in a dehydrator, and it's going to make your house smell fabulous while it's drying. And then those are great to have for tea because mint and lemon verbena, many of these herbs are very full of water. So you have to use a lot of them when you're making tea uh, if you're using fresh. So it's really uh, better for me if I have those, even if, even if I have them in the garden, I prefer to have have them uh, dried to make a wonderful tea. So these are some of the hints that you can use to preserve your herb garden and enjoy it all year long and share it with your friends. For Backyard Basics, I'm Trisha Shari. Thanks for watching. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg. Next week, check out native Texas grasses. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.